Welcome everyone, a very, very warm welcome to you all. I'm Cynthia Lazaroff and I welcome you all this morning from Los Angeles where I'm visiting my family. Thank you each and every one of you who are joining us across many time zones around the world for this very special program on the legacy of nuclear testing, strategies for restorative justice and the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. As of this morning, we have well over 100 people registered from 18 plus countries. And we're honored today to have four extraordinary mentors with us, Tina Cordova, Selena Leem, Sylvia Mishra, and Lily Adams. These women are all dedicated to transforming our nuclear legacy, showing us a pathway forward to restorative justice, banning nuclear testing, nuclear disarmament, and peace. I want to express my gratitude to the Plowshares Fund Women's Initiative for their generous support in making this program possible. Plowshares has been leading the quest to eliminate nuclear weapons since they got started in the early 1980s, 40 years ago. And Plowshares founder, Sally Lilienthal, dedicated her life and heart and soul to this work. We wouldn't be here without Sally, and we wouldn't be here without Plowshares. Now I'd like to welcome my dear friend and teacher, beloved elder in our community on Kauai, Kumu Hula Puna Dawson, who will open our session with a blessing for peace. Puna shares the spirit of aloha wherever she goes. She travels the world sharing aloha, building bridges of peace between the peoples of the Hawaiian Islands and peoples of other countries. Aloha and welcome dear Auntie Puna. Mahalo for being here with us. I invite you now to share your blessing as we open this circle for our session today. Aloha everyone, the blessing is all of us. It's not something that I wave my fingers and uh, it makes magic, no. The, I'm gonna encourage everyone to reach your hands out as far as you can, right and left, and embrace our honey, our earth, and all of its people. We're all one world, we're all one family, and we're the family of this earth. And as family, in being and understanding relationship, it is so important that we value everyone that we have been blessed with on this earth, especially the ones closest to you, because oftentimes we forget to thank them for being in our lives and loving us. I'd like for you to breathe into your hands, offer it up, and now all of our families are talking to each other. This is how we become one. Let us be a part of this place of gift giving where we share in that spirit of aloha that spirit of aloha that is in every culture and every language. Pointing to yourself, understanding how important you are. It is only when you fill yourself up and care for yourself that you're able to share with others. Be mindful of yourself, your family, your community. This is the responsibility that we hold in the world of today. And we create from moment to moment opportunities to help to make a difference and be a part of the blanket of peace. And this is the legacy that we all hold in sharing thought, in sharing intention, in sharing and helping to bless all that is. Do not take for granted the people that surround you. Thank them. Thank them for the joy that they bring daily and even the challenges. When we think about being kind, being kind to yourself is so very important. Then you have kindness for everyone else. When you think about lokahi, being inclusive, recognizing that diversity is healthy not being able to share thoughts and share challenges is what we're all about as a world, especially a world looking for solutions and working for peace. 
when we take the time to listen to things that we may not want to hear, but we will find value and be able to create resolution and solution by helping in the ways that we can, just through intention. And most especially, being humble and realizing that the world we live in and the world that we've been blessed with is a temporary sight if we don't take care of it. And most especially having the patience. So I say to all of you, Akahai, Bokahi, Olu Olu, Ka'aha'a, Ahonu, Aloha, Mahalo. Dear Auntie, thank you so much for that beautiful blessing and for bringing us all together with you in this blanket of peace and reminding us of those we love most in our lives and caring for them and, and our beloved earth at this time. Mahalo. Ten years ago, marked, excuse me, 10 days ago, marked the 76th anniversary of the first ever detonation of a nuclear bomb, which took place at the Trinity site on July 16th, 1945. Over the next five decades, between 1945 and 1996, over 2000 nuclear tests were carried out all over the world, most by the United States and former Soviet Union. 1,032 by the US and 715 by the USSR. Our mentors have spoken about the devastating legacy of nuclear testing in previous sessions. Togjan Casanova spoke of the legacy of Soviet nuclear testing in Kazakhstan, the inter intergenerational trauma, the babies still being born today, generations later with illnesses and deformities. Downwinder Mary Dixon calls nuclear testing an undeclared nuclear war and she showed us Miller's map documenting the foul, fallout from nuclear testing, which reached every county in the continental United States. A CDC National Cancer Institute study of the impact of global fallout on the continental United States found that any person living here since 1951 has been exposed to some radioactive fallout and all of a person's organs and tissues have received some exposure. Nuclear testing has impacted people all over the world, but as we are going to hear again from our mentors today, this testing has disproportionately harmed women and girls, indigenous peoples and peoples of color, with those living downwind and close to nu nuclear test sites like Trinity and in the Marshall Islands, suffering enormous and unimaginable harm. Joanna Macy, 92-year-old Buddhist author and anti-nuclear activist since the 1960s, who has been a huge inspiration to me in my life and work, speaks in Vessels of the Holy, which I've watched countless times, and it's going into the chat now. She speaks about how the splitting of the nucleus of the atom changed everything for humans on this earth and for all beings because it released the strongest binding power in the universe and changed our relationship to time and thus the nature of our karma or consequences of our actions because of the longevity of the radioactive isotopes released that human action, she says, can now reach into geological time spans for not only hundreds of thousands of years, but millions of years and with the use of the waste and depleted uranium now being used in weapons into billions of years. Our mentor Svetlana Alexeyevich, Nobel Prize winning author of Chernobyl Prayer, also speaks of the radionuclides strewn across the earth as a catastrophe of time. Svetlana says that in her presence, in their presence, we humans experience a new sense of time, that from the perspective of human life, radioactive fallout, Svetlana says, is eternal. We are here today because nuclear testing is a crime against humanity, harming generations past, present, and those yet unborn. Justice must be served for all harmed by nuclear testing and nuclear weapons. And our mentors today are going to talk about their remarkable efforts for nuclear justice, including extending the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, RECA, beyond July 22, 2022, when it's set to, set to expire, and amending it 
to include the people of New Mexico, ratifying the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and we'll also hear about the historic treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the first treaty to address the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous peoples, women and girls, the first to provide for compensation and assistance to victims of nuclear use, testing and production, and the first to ban nuclear weapons for all time. <clears throat> Since the dawn of the nuclear age, women have been largely shut out of nuclear policy making and decision making, excluding women, half of the human race for much of the nuclear age has brought us to the brink of possible extinction. Best selling author Elizabeth Lesser says in her new book that when women are the storytellers, the human story changes. We're here today because it's an existential imperative that we write a new story on nuclear testing and nuclear weapons. We're going to hear now from our four pathbreaking mentors who are all doing just that, each in her own way, writing and living a new story, awakening us, inspiring us, courageously claiming their seats at the nuclear table, showing us a way forward to bring restorative justice to those harmed, to bring an end to nuclear testing and to abolish nuclear weapons. These women are welcoming us, inviting us to join them, roll up our sleeves, get to work and get this done. There's not a moment to spare. With that, it's my honor to welcome and introduce our mentors. And I'd like to start with you, Tina, and I will um, introduce each of you in the order in which you speak, just before you speak. Welcome, Tina, again. Tina Cordova is a seventh generation native New Mexican born and raised in the small town of Tularosa in South Central New Mexico. In 2005, Tina co-founded the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, the TBDC, with the late Fred Tyler. The mission of the TBDC is to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the unknowing, unwilling, uncompensated, innocent victims of the first nuclear blast on earth that took place at the Trinity site in South Central New Mexico. In her role as an advocate on behalf of the TBDC, she has testified before the US Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs and the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Welcome again, Tina. My first question for you, you live every day with the legacy of nuclear testing and are dedicated to bringing attention to the impact of the Trinity test on the innocent people of New Mexico, seeking health care and compensation for those who have suffered from overexposure to radiation since 1945. With deep gratitude for all you're doing, we would be honored for you to share your personal journey. What moved you to found TVDC and devote yourself to seeking justice for those who have been harmed? Thank you, Cynthia, and good morning to everybody. It's morning in New Mexico. Um, I, I want to first say that to tell this story adequately, we have to recognize that long ago, New Mexico was declared a sacrifice zone, not by the people of New Mexico, but by the people who were in power at the time. And when I say sacrifice zone, what I mean is that we have the whole cradle to grave process taking place here. The cradle is that they open the earth to take out the uranium. We have over 500 abandoned uranium mines between the Navajo Nation, Laguna Pueblo, Acoma Pueblo. Pueblo, these lands are the land, sacred lands of the indigenous people that have occupied these parts of the world for thousands of years. And uh, we have over 500 abandoned uranium mines where they extracted 32 million tons of uranium in the process of developing the first nuclear weapons. And then from there, um, the sacrifice zone and the cradle to grave process also encompasses the development of nuclear weapons, the testing of nu nuclear weapons, all that have taken place here and continue to take place here as far as development and then the grave is the, the burying of nuclear waste in our, in our precious lands in New Mexico. We, we have the waste isolation pilot plant here and we're under consideration right now for a, 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 a location, it's gonna be called Holtec and it'll be a storage facility for spent uh, plutonium rods that will be basically 
moved from all parts of the United States on rail cars uh, to New Mexico, which is incredibly precarious. And I have to tell you that in sitting in on one of these meetings where Holtec was describing what they intend to do here, there was this beautiful, wise, older woman that asked, how do you um, assure us that you can protect these rail cars as they travel across the United States from some sort of attack and uh, a terrorist attack? And they said, well, we can't. Um, we can't guard every inch of rail, you know, of, of railroad track. And, and it is bizarre to me because on a regular basis, rail cars derail in New Mexico and, and in other parts of our country on a very regular basis. And the thought that they're gonna bring spent uh, plutonium rods here from nuclear power plants when we don't even have the benefit of the, of the electricity that's produced. So that's the cradle to grave process that takes place in New Mexico. My own, gen my own journey to do the work that I do uh, started with my formal education. I have a master's degree in biology. And when I was studying the sciences, I realized that there was an explanation for why people in my community were sick and dying on a regular basis. Uh, I knew that we had an elevated level of cancer and that people were sick and, and that it was really unusual. And it's such a small town. I grew up in a town of about 3,200 people. And at one time I knew 10 people that had brain tumors and the normal incidence of brain tumors is something like one in 5,000. So it's clearly, clearly something that we recognized early on and that I knew from my formal education um, was part of our, of our lives. And then I read a letter to the editor that Fred Tyler, who co-founded the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium or TBDC for short with me wrote. And he basically said, I've been away for 35 years working and I've returned to Tularosa to retire and everyone's sick and dying. And he said, my mother just passed away from three different cancers. And he, he basically said, when are we gonna hold our government accountable? And I called him up immediately and said, Fred, I'm with you on this. I'm a cancer survivor. My father has cancer. And I had to recognize at that point that I was the fourth generation in my family since 1945 to have cancer. My two great grandfathers that lived in Tularosa both had stomach cancer in 1955, what they called stomach cancer in 1955 at a time when no one had ever heard the word cancer in our community. And there was no treat for, treatment for them in a small town in rural New Mexico. And they died um, a horrible death. They were given morphine and sent home to die. Both of my grandmothers had cancer. Uh, didn't, it isn't what ended their lives but both of my grandmothers had cancer um, before they passed. And then my father, who was a four-year-old child living in a downwind community, developed three cancers that he didn't have risk factors for. He developed cancer at the base of his tongue. Uh, he didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't use chewing tobacco, had no viruses. His struggles were immense. It's hard to describe to people what you go through when they have to remove part of your tongue to save your life. And then you go through the resultant uh, radiation treatments to kill anything that's left behind. My dad went from this strapping, very capable, very strong man, uh, younger than I am today when he was first diagnosed to um, somebody who lived off of a feeding tube for over 18 months and lost over 65 pounds. Uh, but my fat father had this amazing will to live and he fought so hard and he survived that initial cancer, which they told us was, was gonna be tough to survive. And then he got prostate cancer, which we used to say was a walk in the park after what he had been through. And then eight years after his first cancer, he developed cancer on the opposite side of his mouth and it wasn't metastatic cancer. They knew that from looking at cells under the microscope and my dad just didn't have the wherewithal anymore to survive that. And then I'm a cancer survivor. When I was 39 years old, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at a time in my life when everything was going incredibly well for me. I'm a successful businesswoman for 31 years. I had a thriving business. 
uh, the first question they asked me was, when were you exposed to radiation? So for me, doing the work that I do is the work I believe I was put here to do. And for many reasons, I, I believe that to be true, because first of all, I'm a cancer survivor. Secondly, I already had learned a great deal about advocacy work as a businesswoman, always working on behalf of minority-owned, women-owned, veteran business owners. And then third, I have a science background, which prepares me to take a look at this through a lens of a scientist. Um, and so in answer to your question, it seems like this is the work that I was meant to do, and it will be my life's work when it's accomplished. Gina, I, I can't imagine <clears throat> what you've been through. And um, I just wanna say again, my deepest vows of gratitude to you and what your family's been through, I just can't imagine. And that you are dedicating your life to doing the work that you know you're meant to do and you're just showing up for it day after day is a gift to all of us in the world. So we're here to support you. And So my next question to you is to please share with us what really happened at the Trinity site on July 16th, 1945, that time that was the first detonation of, the nu of a nuclear bomb and why is the Trinity test different than any other nuclear test that followed? What was the impact on the people of New Mexico, on women, men, children, and on infants? What was the impact on the land, the environment, the food chain, and web of life? And what is the legacy of Trinity today? That's a lot, but I've heard you speak about it before, and it would be really important for us to hear from you about all of that. Well, first of all, because Trinity was the first test of a nuclear bomb any place in the world, uh, there were things that they knew and there were things that they weren't sure about. The things that they knew for certain is that exposure to radiation was detrimental to human health. They did know that. They also knew in advance of detonating the bomb at Trinity that they were gonna produce fallout and that it was likely gonna be very dangerous because people live so close to the Trinity site. And they were warned in advance by the physicians assigned to the test. So, so sometimes people mischaracterize Trinity and say, oh, they didn't know, but they did know that. What they didn't know is exactly what it would take to detonate the bomb at Trinity. So they overpacked it with weapons grade plutonium. They put a, thir a full 13 pounds of plutonium in this bomb when only three pounds were necessary for the fission process. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. An entire 10 pounds of plutonium went up in the fireball that exceeded the atmosphere and penetrated the stratosphere. It became part of the fallout that blanketed all of New Mexico and was traced all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. As it traveled from New Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean, it passed a Kodak processing plant in Indiana and ruined film in Indiana. So you can imagine the intensity of the radiation in New Mexico. The bomb was also the only time they ever detonated a bomb on a platform 100 feet off the ground. And what that meant is the blast came down, intercepted the earth, took up an enormous amount of, of dirt, sand, animal and plant life incinerated it because it produced five times the heat of the sun and more light than the sun and joined it in that fireball that went up. So this ash fell for days on the communities surrounding Trinity. Uh, we've recorded lots of oral histories where people have given us uh, their firsthand accounts of how the ash fell from the sky for days. We didn't have running water in rural parts of New Mexico. And so we counted on the rainwater that fell from the sky to be collected for the, for the purpose of drinking and cooking and um, the per you know, all purposes, cleaning, bathing, et cetera. If you don't have running water, you don't bathe as often. So that during that time frame, if you got ash in your hair or on your scalp or on your skin, it likely stayed there for several days. Um, and so there's three modes of exposure to radiation, inhalation, which was taking place because of the ash that fell, absorption through your skin, which was taking place, and then ingestion. So their full water supply was contaminated. We also didn't have electricity. We had no refrigeration. Some people owned ice boxes and we had booming ice businesses here. 
but we didn't have grocery stores. We, we bought at a mercantile store, sugar, flour, coffee, rice, cereal, but you didn't buy produce. You didn't buy dairy. You didn't buy meat. All of those things were produced by you and your family at your own home. You had a garden, you had a, an orchard, you had, you had cattle, pigs, sheep, you hunted birds, small mammals, um, and women would have been canning and drying everything they could get their hands on. It would have been the height of the harvest in New Mexico. It's also our rainy season when we receive most of our rain. Right now we're in the dead center of our monsoon. It's raining here every single day. So the rain that fell from the sky brought down the largest particles of, of radioactive materials. They got into our cisterns. I believe they remain there um, to this day. So obviously it greatly impacted us. We were maximally exposed. People received very high levels of radiation exposure. If you read the La Hadra report, the 10 year study done by the CDC, the Los Alamos Historic Document Retrieval and Assessment, they clearly say that they believe the day of the event, the exposures to people living in the area could have been as much as 10,000, 10,000 times what's considered acceptable today. What does that mean? After a 10 year decline in infant mortality in New Mexico, as a result of the advent of antibiotics and better hygienic practices, uh, we had this decline in infant mortality. And then all of a sudden in the months directly after Trinity, August, September, October, November, we had these huge spikes in infant mortality. And I tell people all the time, we had casualties at Trinity, and they were our babies. And this is the most unconscionable part of the story for me. It, it, it makes me sick. Um, when healthcare officials in New Mexico contacted the Manhattan District Project and said, our babies are dying. And it was in many cases from a syndrome that looked very much like dysentery, which would coincide with, by the way, high levels of radiation exposure. Our babies are dying and nothing we can do is keeping them alive. Do you know of anything that may be causing this? And the Manhattan District Project decided to look the other way and deny that they knew anything. It's just absolutely unacceptable and it's an outrage. So our, our, our lands were forever changed. I always say it was an environmental invasion that we'll never know the full breadth of because no one has ever come back to assess it. Um, and what is the legacy today? The legacy is that we bury our loved ones on a regular basis. Someone dies and then someone else is diagnosed. And this is an ongoing thing and it's multi-generational. And I, I, I don't, I always say, I just don't see an end to this for us. It is, it is the whole history of Trinity, which has been left untold for all these years. There's always been an over glorification of the science and industry, but no recognition of the people who lived adjacent to the test site. Thank you for bringing all of that to us um, in such a really powerful way. And, and I can see when you talk about your science background, you are able to bring this all together in a way that is so accessible and yet um, from such a knowledge base. Um, so it's, it's so profound and devastating. Um, my next question for you is that many like research biologist Mary Olson have spoken to us in previous sessions about the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on um, women and girls due to ionizing radiation. And please share with us any ways you've observed this in the communities you work with in New Mexico. Well, God bless Mary Olson because she has uncovered another truth about development, testing, and exposure to radiation. Uh, and the truth is that women and girls are more affected. And we do see that play out in our communities. Every woman I know, I, I, I remember clearly when I ask the question in town hall meetings that we hold all across New Mexico, when I ask the question, how many of you have thyroid disease or thyroid cancer? Almost all the women raise their hands in my own family. In my own family, my mother, me, my sister, my mother, we're all on thyroid medication. I've been on thyroid medication since my early 20s. Um, now my nieces have thyroid disease. 
Uh, my grandmothers were both on thyroid medication. My aunties, my it's just unbelievable. Everyone I know is on thyroid medication or has had thyroid cancer or has been told to remove their thyroids because it's going to become cancerous. We see we see this amongst women in New Mexico. We see a lot of, of cancer of, of the female reproductive organs and a lot of infertility amongst women and a lot of breast cancer. And the one thing that I mentioned earlier about the babies dying, this is also part of the story that just to me is, is unacceptable. The mothers unknowing to them would have been concentrating the radiation in their mammary glands and poisoning their babies without knowledge. And I think that that's just, like I said before, it's an outrage that nobody mentioned to them that this would have happened and their little babies' bodies would have not been able to overcome the radiation load of not just their exposure from Trinity, but their ongoing radiation load from being breastfed by their mothers. We also know that it's the women in our communities that land up being the caregivers, even at times when they're sick themselves. It's been a huge burden for women in New Mexico. And I have found that the strongest advocates who work side by side with me have been women because they have, they have really borne this you know, the brunt of this has been on their shoulders. There's no doubt that women have been more affected in our communities. Well, as a woman and as a mother who probably the, who breastfed my daughter for a long time, that was one of the most joyous moments of, my, you know, times in my life. And to hear you speak about this and mothers who didn't realize what they were doing and that they were unknowingly bringing poison to their children, their babies that killed them is just um, so much to be with. Um, so um, we're with you. And what are the false narratives about the Trinity test and how are you working at TBDC to address these false narratives? You've talked a little bit about this, but um, what the, some of the false narratives are, but would love to hear how you're working to, um, to really set them right. Well, and if you don't mind, I'd like to also mention, because you talked about, uh, you know, these mothers that were unknowing, unknowingly poisoning their children, the terrible part of that, that history is that no one ever spoke about it afterwards. I just recently had a member of my family come to me and say, that my great aunt lost a baby during that time frame, and that he was born with such horrible malformations and that she lost another child after that. We see a lot of that documented and they just never spoke about it. And they were left to wonder why and what they had done wrong. And they suffered their whole lives with that, carrying that burden of what was wrong with them and, and why did this happen to them? And it's, it's just not, it's, it's hard to wrap my mind around. Um, but I think your question about false narrative is very important to address because our government has always controlled the messaging around Trinity and what they've said, what they said at the time and what they continue to say today when they open the site twice a year to visitors, which is just craziness to me, but six to 8,000 people will go in there on the day that they open the Trinity site and they'll take tour buses in there and they treat it as though it's it's a carnival almost. They serve you food out there, but there's big signs everywhere that say, you know, radiation danger, don't remove anything from this site. Um, and, and it's just insane. But what they say to everybody is that no one lived here, no one was harmed. The area is remote and uninhabited. But I'll tell you what, for the first time ever, we have a rebuttal to that because I speak regularly, regularly to students at the University of New Mexico in classes offered there about all things nuclear. And I always appeal to the students for help with special projects. And this year, a student took me up on it and created what we call the 150 mile Trinity map, 150 mile radius Trinity map. And the map has Trinity located in New Mexico, and then it's got 10 mile increments drawn all the way to 150 miles. 
And we now know that, for example, at 10 miles, there was no one living there. And we pretty much knew that. We knew that the closest people living there were at 12 miles. But at 50 miles, there were close to 15,000 people living there. That's not remote and uninhabited. At 150 miles, per their own admission, the safe zone is outside 150 miles. We had close to half a million people living here. It included Albuquerque and Santa Fe to the north, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez to the south, the New Mexico-Arizona border to the west, and almost to the Texas border to the east. It was in our entire state. And so while the government may want to continue to say, oh, no one was harmed because no one was living no one was living here. The truth of the matter is we took the 1940 census data and we overlaid it with, because at the end of the test, Dr. Hempelman wrote a, a memo to General Groves and said, we can never do this here again. We so overexpose people to radiation. And if we ever do it again, any place, we have to find an area with a 150 mile radius uninhabited. Well, we know now that there were close to half a million people living here at 150 miles. That is not remote. That is not an uninhabited area. And they're going to have to now address um, that because we have this incredible map created by Brian Kendall, this brilliant student from the University of New Mexico. Um, I really look forward to seeing that map and um maybe we can get it shared in the chat or um, it's, I think it's really important for people to see it and to understand it and to realize that the communities of Albuquerque and Santa Fe are in that 150 mile radius um, beyond all of the others in that, in that space. I also just wanna say that I, in preparing for this was reading some of the affidavits that you've been collecting from people on your website. And I've asked Tom to put it, that link into the chat right now because some of them are handwritten. I mean, some of them are, and, and just of people's experiences documenting that you're going out and chronicling and documenting person by person and sharing this um, evidence and, and th the stories, bringing them forward. Um, and I know that this plays into um, my next question, which is for you, which is related to the radiation exposure Compensation Act that's now provided 2.5 billion in compensation for people in other states who have suffered overexposure to radiation, but it excludes the people of New Mexico, which is beyond me, is beyond all understanding. So at TBDC, you are seeking to rectify this injustice and calling for amendments to RECA in addition to having it extended because it's expiring next year. Um, which would extend the support to New Mexico. Um, so please share more about your work and how we can support you in your efforts to seek justice. What is one thing we can start to do right now? And again, you can put links in the chat um, if you have any that you'd like to share with us. Well, absolutely. You know, I was in Tularosa last week because we had our candlelight vigil and we called out the names of over 700 people through a voluntary process. Somebody has come forward and given us their names. I always say if I could go door to door, we would call out the names of thousands of people who have died, not just 700. But imagine, I told everybody in our town hall meeting last weekend, imagine if just 1,500 people in, New, in Tularosa, just 1,500, and I know the number will be far greater than that, qualify for RECA, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, qualify for the partial restitution, because that's how it has always been characterized, and that's a very good character, characterization. There's no such thing as compensation through RECA, it's just a partial restitution. But imagine if only 1,500 people received that in the small town of Tularosa. It would bring, the, we're asking for the one-time payment to be increased from 50,000 to 150,000. 50,000 won't take you through one year of treatment for cancer. So, especially because in rural New Mexico, people have to travel. You don't get diagnosed where you live. You don't get treated where you live. You always have to travel someplace. And if you travel, you have the cost of gas, food, lodging. And then on top of that, your co-payments, your co-insurance, your deductibles, et cetera. So I told them, imagine if just 1,500 people qualified here 
that would bring $225 million into the little village, the poor, poor, poor community that I grew up in. And I, it's life changing. It would change the face of that community. It would change people's lives. I know families that will qualify for probably five members of their family that have died. And I just think to myself, it will mean the difference between people living in poverty or not, because we've been relegated to that living in poverty. When you spend everything you have to take care of your health, uh, you're left with nothing. So we're asking that they increase the one-time restitution payment from 50 to 150. We're asking for health care coverage, which I know will mean the difference between life and death for some people. We're asking that they extend it through 2045, and we're asking them to grant us a qualification period that's meaningful from 1944 through 1962 when they stopped doing a above ground testing at Nevada. New Mexico is well documented as having been downwind of Nevada. Now, why were we left out? No one will ever know. I always say it's the $2.5 billion question, right? But what they tell us is there's no money for this. And let me say to you, first of all, that that is absolutely not true. When I testified recently um, in, in the House Committee, uh, Representative Johnson from Georgia said something like, let me get this straight. We spend $500 billion every 10 years to guard our nuclear arsenal. That's 50 billion a year. And he said, and we've paid out 2.5 billion over 31 years to these people. That's a pittance. And for New Mexico, it's less than a pittance because we haven't received one dime. So what can people do now? This is a social justice issue, Cynthia plain and simple social justice issue. There's a moral and an ethical imperative to correct this, to tell all of the history, to admit the lies that have been told for 76 years and to correct that. We will never heal from what we've done. We were American citizens, tax paying American citizens that were, uh, you know, who had our lives destroyed. He said also, there's been no life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for these people. And I say that all the time. When he said it, I thought, bingo, he gets it. You know what I'm saying? And so what you can do now, everybody needs to start lobbying their members of Congress. We can no longer have them tell us there's not enough money to do this. That is not an acceptable answer. And it's not an answer that reasonable people can expect. So start contacting your members of Congress, tell them that this is important to you as a citizen of the United States, that you view it as a social injustice, and that you really want to help bring justice to all the people who've been harmed, not the people, just the people of New Mexico, the Pacific Islanders that are included, the, the people in places like Idaho, Montana, the states that have been obviously left out. Um, we don't have bill numbers yet, but they'll be introduced soon. And if people are interested, they can keep an eye on our website. As soon as the bills are introduced, we will have all the information at our website. Unfortunately, we don't have bill numbers yet, but soon to be introduced bills. And, and that would be the, the most help that anyone can give us because we need every vote, especially in the Senate. In the Senate, we're gonna have, we have to make a strong case for this. There will be people there who will not support this idea because they'll say there's not enough money to do it. May it be so, may, may this come to pass to bring you all the support you need to begin to have the support you need to, to, to heal and to get the justice that is so, is so urgently needed. Um, Thank you. We'll come back to you at the end when we ask you all questions in the round. And I'd like now to move to you, Lily. Um, and I'll begin by introducing you. Lily Adams is an independent consultant specializing in nuclear weapons issues. Lily is the founder and coordinator of the Nuclear Voices Project, which builds connections between nuclear policy organizations and nuclear frontline communities and seeks to amplify issues of nuclear justice. She is a consultant for the Union of Concerned Scientists in their Global Security Program and is a member of the Board of Directors of the Arms Control Association. Lily is also a 2019 alumna of the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation's Public Policy and Nuclear Threats Boot Camp and previously ran the Anti-Nuclear Weapons Program at Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Welcome again, Lily. And I just wanna personally say you've been such a support and help to me 
um, over this past year and introduced me to members in previous sessions, Beata Totsi Pena, and now Tina in this session, and also Selena. So, um, so grateful to you for your support just of this whole program and bringing this together. Um, welcome. And I want to just begin by asking you. You've been doing pathbreaking advocacy work in support of nuclear frontline communities, seeking justice, bringing attention to the many harms they have suffered and the human impacts of nuclear weapons. You've created a project called Nuclear Voices to foster collaboration between frontline communities and people working on federal nuclear policy and arms control. Deep gratitude to you for all you're doing. What inspired you to create Nuclear Voices and what are you hoping to achieve? Thanks so much, and, and thank you for having me here today. It's such an honor to be here um, with such an incredible panel, and thank you to Tina for that, um, you know, you're sharing your experiences and all of your work with us. Um, so, yeah, I was inspired to start doing this work um, because of my time in Washington State at Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, that's where I first started learning about even the concept of frontline communities in the nuclear space, which was completely new to me. And my introduction to that was um, by learning about the impacts of nuclear testing on the Marshall Islands. So I had the amazing opportunity to meet people in the Marshallese community in Washington state, um, many of whom have moved to Washington in part for cancer care uh, because it's, um, it's impossible to get cancer care in the Marshall Islands. So people have to travel and there's a lot of cancer care infrastructure in Washington. Um, and that was just incredibly powerful and moving. Um, and then I started to learn about the other impacts of nuclear weapons right there in Washington state. So I grew up, I grew up there um, close to Seattle, um, but had not known about these communities in my own state that had been so gravely harmed. So even including the you know, Hanford nuclear site, I knew very little about. There's uranium, uranium mining in Washington that I had was not aware existed. There are over a thousand nuclear weapons based in Washington state. And I felt shocked and horrified that I had grown up here and had gotten through high school and college and didn't even know that um, those impacts were right there at home. Um, and you know, I was new to the nuclear weapons field at that point. I was about a year in. And I felt frustrated that this wasn't a larger conversation in the nuclear weapons field, that I didn't see it being discussed very much, or a lot of work going towards it. Um, and I saw that so many of these communities uh, that have been directly impacted, you know, they are dedicating so much volunteer time. You know, these, this is not often people's jobs to work on these issues. They're, you know, dedicating time outside of their normal jobs. They often have limited resources and access. You know, they're fighting against the same systems that harmed them in the first place. So sometimes there are these insurmountable obstacles. Whereas I was in a community that often has, you know, money and resources and access to decision makers. Um, and then at the same time, the nuclear policy community that I was a part of is also struggling to connect with the public about nuclear weapons issues and um, to show people that these issues are also human issues and justice issues, as Tina was saying. So, it, you know, it felt like there was this opportunity maybe to help connect these different communities um, but especially for the groups in the nuclear policy world, where it was possible to support frontline communities and their goals, and maybe lend some of those resources and access where they could to support these incredibly important goals that frontline communities were working on. Um, so that was sort of the or origin of the idea for the database. How can we connect these groups and actually form meaningful relationships, make it easier to connect, but then build long term uh, meaningful collaborations between these communities. Um, I have to say, I have to shout out my old boss at Washington PSR, uh, Laura Skelton, who had the original idea for a, something like a database for this kind of resource. So she has been um, incredibly important in the creation of this project, and I owe her a lot. Um, and then, you know, once I began creating the database, I, I started just by talking to people. I just reached out to people I knew and started to hear their stories. Actually, um, Tina was one of the first people I talked to when I started this project. Um, and it was those stories. It was um, you know, the stories that grabbed me and compelled me to keep doing this work and what has always compelled me since I started doing this to stay in this work. Um, because I think you know, anyone who just 
listen to, you know, Tina speak, you can't walk away from a story like that and not want to try to do something. And so I think being in the nuclear field, when I hear those stories, I think, you know, what can we in the nuclear field do to support that kind of work? It's just so important and so crucial. That's really what the database is supposed to get at. Lily, it's great. It's a wonderful database. I've had a chance to really look at it um, in recent months and also in getting ready for this session. And um, could you share more about the database itself, maybe show it to us and how you think it can be most useful in advancing justice for frontline communities and how people and organizations who aren't included can be included and how we can best use it to serve um, you know, in support of seeking nuclear justice and restorative justice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and this is actually such a great opportunity to talk about it at this event because I created it uh, originally with a small grant from the Plowshares Foundation. Um, it's also supported my work uh, over the years and it was kind of a pilot project. So the database, database right now is pretty small. We, we you know, kind of went into it with an experiment, like, will this be a helpful resource? Um, and now I have, I'm so grateful to have some additional funding to assess the database and kind of let's take a look a year later. Is this a helpful tool? Is this help actually achieving those goals? And if so, how can we improve it and expand it? So it's a great time actually for anyone on the call as I'm gonna, I'll put it up in a moment to provide feedback. I would love to hear feedback and suggestions. There's a contact form on the database website. Um, for how it could be improved. And also if you're interested in being included on the database, this is a great time because I'll be trying to expand it. Um, so the, the goal is really to create that awareness of who exists in this realm, you know, who, what nuclear frontline communities and individuals are working and what are they working on? And then on the nuclear policy side, who's interested in um, collaborating with those folks. And the hope was really to make it as easy as possible to connect. So I'll pull it up now. Um, let's see if this, is that working? Can folks see my screen? Okay, great. So this is the website. It's very simple. Again, hopefully um, if it keeps going, we'll get to make it a little prettier and um, flesh it out a little bit more, but there's just sort of this intro um, homepage and then the database is the really the big biggest portion of the website. It's organized here by community. So different kinds of frontline communities. I'd love to add Habakusha as um, going forward. Um, groups of survivors of the bombings in Japan as well. Um, and then when you click on one of these communities, there's a list of different organizations and individuals involved. So maybe an organization or just an individual if they're not associated with a specific group. And then um, in terms of the content that's included, you know, right away, the idea was to have contact information. So their contact information is there to be used so people can reach out. They've you know, said they would like to be contacted. Um, started with some background, but then also successes. I felt like when I was talking to groups, it was so important to make sure that there was a celebration and recognition of the truly incredible work that these organizations are doing that often um, is not celebrated as, as much as it should be in the nuclear weapons field, I think. Um, so we wanted to start with that. And then um, what are the projects that these groups are working on and what do they see as the opportunities for collaboration? So again, it's really, Hope, the hope and the goal is to make it easy to understand and see these ways for groups to work together. Um, and then there is also a section in the database uh, for uh, nuclear policy groups. The entries are a little bit shorter. Um, so here's an arms control association. There's a little background and then opportunities for collaboration. So the focus is really on frontline groups. And then in terms of um, groups being included in the database, you know. This is a, a small selection. It's by no means comprehensive. There, are, you know, there's roughly you know 25 groups and in terms of frontline groups in the database now, and hopefully we can double, triple that going forward. Um, and so, would love to hear if you people are interested in being included. And there's a form here on the contact page for joining the database. <clears throat> Lily, it's it's so great the way you're fostering contact and collaboration and. Um... It's just, it's a wonderful resource. My, my next question to you also um, is about something that I came across in the database and it really deals with it. In your work with frontline communities, you've witnessed and gained insight into what's helpful and what's not helpful. And on your resource page, you share the wisdom of your experience and offer guidelines on working with frontline communities in a non-transactionable and equitable way. 
You also offer resources on why it's imperative we address racism and structural oppression in our work and organizations. And you put this all together before the widespread calls to address systemic racism following the murder of George, George Floyd last year. What are some of the most important things you've learned in your work? And we would love for you to share a few of your most profound insights and the recommendations you have for us. Sure, yes. And I will start by saying, I feel like it's always important to have this caveat that um, I am not an expert on <laughs> how to do this perfectly. I'm learning as I go, just like anyone else. So, you know, even creating this resource on working equitably with frontline communities, you know, that is a, a living document that I hope can be constantly improved and getting feedback. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, as soon as I started talking to frontline communities, what I heard again and again was that, you know, sometimes folks in the nuclear policy community or elsewhere had reached out, maybe they had worked with people, but sometimes that work could be damaging. Instead of, you know, being helpful, it could feel exploitative or extractive or like you said, transactional, tokenizing. Um, and so not that frontline groups didn't want to work with, you know, others in the nuclear policy community, but that they wanted those groups to be reaching out intentionally, thoughtfully, um, and being aware of these dynamics. Um, and so, you know, this resource was created with uh, input and feedback and collaboratively with a couple of frontline community members that I worked with. Um, Beata, actually, who you mentioned earlier, Beata Sosipenga, she was very involved in creating this, um, was very helpful. Um, and just really making sure that as you're reaching out, you're thinking through these common pitfalls and ensuring that, you know, what are your intentions for reaching out? Is it for your, to serve your own goals and, you know, further for your own purposes, or is it actually genuinely to help these communities? Because if it's not the latter, you shouldn't be reaching out. Um, and uh, also what you were saying was anti-racism, you know, it became clear too that because so many frontline communities are communities of color and indigenous communities, it was inextricable from anti-racism work. And, you know, um, that was something that I talked about with people that if groups are reaching out, they should be addressing racism in their own, um, in their field, in their organizations and in themselves uh, in order to be reaching out in an equitable way. So this is um, organized into some general guidelines, longer term considerations, and then some just specific tips. And some of these in the general guidelines, I come back to a lot and, um, I've been thinking about a lot lately, definitely um, this here, realizing as the more that I meet people in, in frontline communities, the more you realize that just like any community, they are not a monolith, one person or one group is not representative of an entire community and people approach these issues in different ways, have different perspectives on how to address them. Just like in the nuclear policy community, you know, how many different groups are there working on non-proliferation and disarmament, but in very different ways with different ideas on the best strategies and tactics, and it's the same here, of course. Um, but we can tend to think, okay, all maybe all uranium mining communities are working on it in this way, and that's just not the case. So it takes a lot longer to understand those complexities and really get to know all the different groups and individuals, but that time to get to know those um, complexities is so important. Uh, because you just can't treat it as like a one size fits all solution or treat people as if they are all going to be approaching it in the same way. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned that I continue to have to relearn and work on more and more is learning to really step back. I think all of us or many of us, you know, in our jobs, we're used to seeking out a leadership role. You know, you're the leader of your team or you lead the meeting or you set the strategy for your work. And in working with frontline communities, you know, this is their lived experiences, their expertise. It's so important to take a step back and maybe not be the leader and take your cues from them. And that I think for a lot of us who are in our jobs are used to the other side of things that can feel uncomfortable and it um, is a definite change of pace. And, um, but again, it's so important because we probably don't have the right answers. We're not from these communities. So how can we know how to fix these issues um, or work towards justice, we need to learn from those communities themselves. So um, I think that takes a lot of humility. That's the biggest piece that I have learned. Being humble as I approach these issues and approach these communities is so important. Um, and the last thing I would say is just um, this first one I come back to again and again and again, be in it for the long haul. Don't go in for this, you know, one and done one specific event, one specific, you know, media piece. This is, these are, you know, 
I think the way to be successful in this work is to build long-term relationships, especially because these are such challenging, complex issues. And I find, you know, when I have a misstep, when I make a mistake, it's those long-term relationships that allow us to um, keep working together, talk through those really hard issues of, oh, did I misinterpret this? Did I inadvertently offend someone? If you don't have that relationship and that trust, you can't work through those. And that means you can't do this work for the long-term. So those long-term relationships are what I value most about this work. Um, and like anything, they take lots of time to cultivate, but that is you know, so crucial to me and, and what I do uh, with these communities. Well, I thank you. I've so appreciated in getting to know you, the word that came to me before you even said it was how, how with the humility with which you approach um, this work. And, and also that it's such a teaching that, that what you are doing such a holistic integrated approach to this with all these different aspects brought together in this website. So just um, really thank you for all of this. It's, it's really important for all of us doing this work. And also just what you mentioned about the long-term, that this is, this, is, this is not a sprint. This is really a long distance, lifelong run. run. I mean, Tina spoke of it, it being a lifelong um, commitment and, and a lifelong process. So thank you for all that. And, and again, another part of your integrated approach is the oral histories that you bring in to this work and they're in the database. Maybe you could just talk briefly about the most effective way you think that these oral histories can be shared and, and utilized to advance um, justice for frontline communities. Yeah, absolutely. I will say the oral history section of the website and the first um, you know, grant I received to create this was probably the smallest section of the database or of this website. And it's something I really hope that I can um, expand on in this next iteration because um, those stories are so important. Um, you know, I think uh, stories are what allow us to see nuclear weapons, not at the, as these you know, theoretical um, I don't know, you know, hard pieces of, of metal and numbers, budgets, warheads, missiles, but as um, these truly horrific, inhumane um, weapons that have very real and very grave consequences for real people, which we can forget, I think, in the nuclear policy world when we do get wrapped up in those numbers. Um, and, you know, in reality, we cannot have nuclear weapons without harming people. I think that's what these stories teach us. Their very existence involves the inevitable harm of communities. And that is a huge reason why we have to fight against them. So the stories help us remember that. And um, I think, you know, we are coming to a time where we're at risk of those stories being forgotten. Um, because in some cases, these impacts did happen many decades ago. You look at Habakusha or the average age of a survivor from the bombings in Japan is now they're now in their 80s. Um, and if we let those stories be forgotten, then I think um, we won't be able to remember those lessons from history. Um, and in terms of how they're used, you know, I think um, I hear this from members of Congress. They want those stories to be more accessible and available because they use them in their advocacy. Um, and, but, you know, in, in events like these, I think those stories are so crucial in media and, and honestly, in any work we're doing, I think shifting to a framework of how we can use storytelling as an essential tool of our work on nuclear weapons is so important. And I think storytelling, it doesn't often seem to go hand in hand with nuclear weapons work, but I do think it is so crucial. So, um, yeah, I really do hope that this can be um, an expanded part going forward of the, of the website. That's that's great, Lily. The personal stories are just make it all tangible and real for us. So thank you for for this, and and I hope that you are able to expand it soon. Um, I the, my last question is just um, on the event you recently co-organized for the Washington Marshallese Nuclear Remembrance Week with Washington BSR and many frontline groups and Marshall ad, Marshallese advocates. Um, and please share more about the project and what the next steps are with your work to advance justice for frontline communities and how can we get involved and support your efforts and is there something we can start to do right now. Yeah, so this was an incredible event um, and led by the COFA Alliance National Network, which is this is their website where we hosted the event page. Um, 
And uh, COFA stands for Compact or Free Association, uh, which is a unique uh, sort of uh, relationship between uh, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau with the United States. Um, but so in March, uh, March 1st is the anniversary of the Castle Bravo test in the Marshall Islands, the largest US nuclear weapons test ever done. Um, and you know, this is a time, it's a national holiday in the Marshall Islands, and it's a time to remember um, the traumas of that testing, but also the strength and resilience of the Marshallese community um, and their advocacy and their um, you know, continuation of their culture and incredible strength. So this was a, a wonderful event driven by this very beautiful theme, We Are Not Alone, that was suggested by actually an atomic veteran who was stationed in the Marshall Islands cleaning up uh, the radioactive waste from nuclear weapons tests after the testing there. Um, and just this idea that, you know, the Marshallese community is standing in solidarity and seeking community and relationship with nuclear impacted communities all across the world and that, you know, we are together in these fights. So that was really, that's what drove the event. It was um, very powerful in bringing together communities all across the country and across the world. Um, and the next steps will be to try to, you know, beyond this event, how can we continue to build those relationships and continue to work together on our advocacy goals um, and just um, being with one another, sharing those wisdoms and those stories and those experiences going forward. Um, for folks listening, I think um, this was also done in collaboration with the Marshall Islands National Nuclear Commission, which is um, a body created our uh, uh, by the Marshallese government, it's a, although in itself is a non-governmental entity, uh, kind of tasked with um, driving a strategy for nuclear justice that is, you know, from and of the Marshallese community. So what does nuclear justice mean to the Marshallese people and how can um, it be implemented? So they have uh, created this incredible document uh, called Nuclear Justice for the Marshall Islands coordinated action for justice. And part of the goal of the National Nuclear Commission is to also serve as a liaison for groups that are interested in supporting the Marshallese community to work with um, Marshallese groups and the Marshallese government. So for anyone interested in supporting that work, this is sort of, it's my go-to resource. That's what I always point people to. It's an incredible document that has so much information and so much, um, so much guidance for how to work with the Marshallese community. So um, I'm not sure I'm if it's in the chat, if it's not, I'll drop it in the chat once I'm done. Um, but this is where I would really direct people as um, my first stop for uh, learning more about how to support the Marshallese community in, in their um, fight for justice. Thank you, Lily. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it and all you're doing. Um, I next want to welcome Sylvia Mishra. Um, Sylvia is a new tech nuclear officer at the European Leadership Network and a doctoral researcher at the Department of Defense Studies at King's College London. Her research focuses on nuclear strategy and nonproliferation, Southern Asian security, grand strategy, and emerging technologies. She co chairs the CBRN Working Group for Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. The Indian Women in International Relations at Global Policy Insights is an N Square Innovators Network Fellow and the Mid Career Cadre Scholar at CSIS. Sylvia has spoken widely at conferences and published numerous articles. She is a board member of Atomic Reporters and co founder of the CYG, the, Internet, the International Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Youth Group. Welcome, Sylvia. So happy to have you with us. And you are one of the women who inspired. Um, the starting of women uh, transforming our nuclear legacy. So a special welcome to you and gratitude to you for that. So my first question to you is, you are dedicated to advancing peace and disarmament and you're engaged with many wonderful organization and educational efforts on nuclear issues with gratitude for all you're doing. In 2016, you were one of the co-founders of the CYG, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Youth Group, which has now grown there were five co-founders and it's now grown to over a thousand members. What inspired you and the other to start CYG? What is your mission and what do you hope to achieve? First of all, thank you so much, Cynthia. It's, so, it's such a wonderful honor uh, to be here in this uh, very esteemed panel. I really appreciated uh, all the inputs and remarks uh, and especially uh, sharing their life stories that 
uh, Tina and uh, Lily shared with us. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so uh, yes, you're right. Uh, I was one of the uh, founding members of the uh, CTBT uh, youth group. It was, uh, it was an initiative that was started by the executive uh, secretary, Dr. Lucina Zerbo, on the 20th anniversary for opening of signatures for uh, the CTBT. Um, and um, and I, I was in Vienna and when we uh, founded uh, this group, one of the most important criteria or one of the most important rational why we did this was essentially uh, to uh, raise awareness of the CTBT as an important arms control and non-proliferation dis disarmament effort, but also uh, to raise understanding and education about the treaty specifically amongst a younger people. So it was just not about stakeholders of uh, the CTBT, which predominantly involved a state, but also training and uh, educating the next generation who would be the leaders of tomorrow about the importance of CTBT. And uh, participation in the uh, youth group was also very close to my heart because that was my launch into the nuclear uh, policy field. I was uh, at that point of time working in New Delhi uh, where uh, I was focused on India, US defense and security cooperation as part of what I used to do uh, was also looking at uh, nuclear uh, po policy issues. But when I received this invitation, uh, from uh, the CTBTO to join uh, Vienna for this conference, I was asked to uh, say no uh, to this and pass, the, pass my conference invitation to a male colleague of mine. Uh, and my senior said that, uh, well, nuclear uh, weapons issues are very technical issues and not really uh, meant uh, for uh, women. Uh, you stick to geopolitics and analyzing foreign policy issues. And uh, that is when um, I kind of put my foot down. I actually moved out of that uh, particular uh, job. And, uh, th and that is when uh, it kind of really had a, a launch uh, to uh, nuclear policy issues in Vienna, engaging uh, with the CT BTO youth group. You're right, over, over the span of the last almost four and a half, five years, we've grown strength to strength, but what predominantly the CTBTO youth group has been able to do is get more number of younger women um, and scholars who are interested in research, who are interested in advocacy and communications about nuclear policy issues, arms control and disarmament. So uh, when, we are, when we look at the numbers of the, uh, of we have like more number of younger uh, like women uh, who are a part of the youth group. So one, so in during the last five years, what we have uh, tried to do essentially is raise awareness about the CTBD. Talk about what are uh, what are the what do annex two countries? What are their positions? Why is the CTBD still not entered into force? So we do it through uh, research. We do it through advocacy work. The CTBD has also partnered with several grassroots level organization who does uh, advocacy work uh, in terms of underscoring and highlighting the importance of banning nuclear uh, testing and also in terms of elevating the status and role of the CTBT uh, for it to enter into force. That's, that's great, Sylvia. Thank you. I didn't realize uh, about your personal history um, as a woman in the field. And so um, it's very inspiring to hear about that part of your journey. Um, so can you just share a little bit about the treaty, the current status, what the CTPT has achieved thus far, and what the greatest obstacles are to its entry into force? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this uh, question. I, I think uh, it is really important to understand uh, that uh, the relevance that CTBT uh, like carries in this 21st century, especially at a time when uh, countries are expanding uh, their nuclear arsenal inventories. Uh, new, web, uh, new technologies, emerging technologies have come to the forefront and their integration with nuclear weapons are making the world more uh, riskier. There are the number of nuclear dangers and the threat of accidental wars, miscalculation has just risen. So in this backdrop, it is really important to take a look at the CTBT. The CTBT, which essentially is 
uh, bans all kinds of nuclear uh, testing has still not entered into force. And the reason why the CDBT has not entered into fo uh, force is the treaty has a clause that all the 44 nuclear uh, capable countries identified in the text of the treaty needs to sign and ratify the treaty. Out of that, almost uh, five countries have uh, signed the treaty, which includes Iran, Israel, uh, the United States, uh, uh, China, uh, and there's another uh, country, um, Egypt, they have uh, signed the treaty, but have not ratified the treaty. And India, Pakistan, and North Korea, they have not signed, nor have they ratified the treaty. So these eight countries together, they form the uh, they form the eight countries, which we call the Annex Two countries. So up until these countries uh, ratify and sign and ratify the treaty, the CTBT cannot enter into force. But even though the, uh, the treaty has not entered into force, it has provided tremendous benefit to the scientific community. And especially because the verification regime of uh, the treaty, the International Monitoring System Network, it, it is a network of almost 337 networks around the globe, which essentially provides an instrumental role in terms of detecting nuclear uh, testing. And therefore, one of the uh, major achievements of the treaty is that it has successfully married uh, the nuclear uh, policy community with the scientific community, with also the arms control and disarmament uh, community. And it provides really bridge building efforts in not just uh, detecting uh, nuclear testing, but all different kinds of civil applications of the international monitoring uh, system, especially detecting earthquakes or, or uh, finding, uh, for example, this is something that I really enjoy is like for finding and tracing a whale migration and uh, are some of the uh, very uh, visible civil uh, applications of the international monitoring uh, system. So, uh, so whilst often the relevance of the CTBT 25 years after uh, it was opened for signature and it has still not entered into force is often being questioned, but one has to really realize that no, no arms control and um, arms control and disarmament effort can go without the first signature and ratification of the treaty because it is the first step where you ban nuclear testing where countries come together and decide that nuclear testing uh, has has to uh, come to a stop. And often uh, the CTBT's relevance in terms of the NPT, uh, which is the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty and the TPNW, which is a treaty on the pro uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons, which really makes a nuclear weapons illegal. Uh, it The CTBT is complementary to these treaties and therefore the global uh, strategic non-proliferation and arms control community have to find ways and synergies how to really elevate the position of the CTBT uh, within the frameworks of uh, the NPT and the TPNW. So hey, that's really helpful to see it put it in the context of the other treaties and also what the obstacles are and what what we need to do to actually get the treaty ratified. Uh, it's, it's all, you really did a beautiful job of that. Um, my next question is to you um, about the CYG, which I've found personally so inspiring because you have young people working together from all countries in the world, including eight of the nuclear armed, nine of nuclear armed states. And many of you are working very closely and collaborating amidst escalating tensions with youth and colleagues who are from countries that are your native country's nuclear adversary. Um, what has it been for you personally as a native of nuclear armed India to be working closely with youth from nuclear armed Pakistan and China? And what is your vision for how such long term collaboration among youth from nuclear adversaries might serve to build trust and regional cooperation to reduce the risk of a nuclear confrontation and advance um, the CBT, CTBT non proliferation and, and disarmament? And why? Why is the role of youth so important in this? Uh, Cynthia, first of all, uh, I, I really think that all your questions are so uh, thoughtfully um, uh, crafted. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, that. 
I feel uh, where the youth group was really a path breaking uh, initiative was because it really attracted uh, folks from different parts of the world. As like when I joined the youth, uh, youth group, I was living in Delhi and I had little to very uh, like zero contacts with my counterparts or like young researchers who were in uh, China or Pakistan or for that matter from uh, the Middle East. And it really uh, were very helpful to get uh, young uh, people who are working on defense and nuclear policy issues come and uh, try to think through their country's perspectives on what really holds them back in terms of uh, signing and ratifying uh, the treaty. So one of the most important things that the CTBTO youth group uh, did was not just amalgamation and trying to understand each other's perspectives, but we also tried to red team and like be in each other's shoes and trying to uh, figure what what really prevents or what is their country's uh, position. So th that kind of really created an atmosphere of uh, care and sensitivity towards thinking of what really uh, are the security vulnerabilities of the other countries. So when we're talking or say, for example, sitting in New Delhi and working on nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, policy issues or defense issues, we are always are trained in thinking which are the pr uh, predominant uh, views, uh, but like, and, and uh, participating with different uh, different uh, young folks from other organizations in a multilateral uh, forum really provides you a better understanding of the security vulnerabilities of the other countries. So that was uh, one, but also uh, it was really uh, great to uh, brainstorm and have creative ideas, which were not really, really always uh, uh, always uh, structured in uh, what are the predominant uh, views of different countries, but have more creative ideas on how the youth um, can play a leading uh, role in uh, terms of advancing uh, understanding on uh, the CTBT and uh, nuclear non-proliferation issues. One of the things that I uh, felt uh, uh, it was a great contribution of the CTBTO youth group was to uh, get a uh, pair up uh, people from different countries and region and make them uh, write uh, analytical pieces. So I actually uh, partnered uh, with my counterparts from the United States uh, and uh, from um, other countries and wrote analytical pieces uh, trying to understand uh, like, you know, what are the next step forwards, which are not really uh, embedded in the old view in the Cold War kind of uh, thinking in the rigid uh, views of our elders, but what could be some of the more creative and innovative ways where uh, countries and the next generation uh, leaders uh, could uh, partner and um, and for for this reason I, I think um I uh, wrote uh, this uh, paper on how India uh, should uh, participate with the CTBTO's international monitoring system. So both India and Pakistan, after they tested their nuclear weapons, they immediately uh, declared that they are going to hold on to a unilateral moratorium on non-testing. But, but both the countries do not engage with the, uh, both India and Pakistan do not engage with the uh, CTBTO's international monitoring system network. Uh, one of the creative uh, and I think innovative ideas that I have, and it, it would be really interesting to see uh, like more uh, takers of this idea of from the government is for India and Pakistan to jointly, uh, because they both have a unilateral moratorium, to jointly participate in the international monitoring system, because as a confidence building measure, if both the countries are able to do that, uh, it also provides both the countries as a as a nuclear confidence building measure where both countries are um, are aware of the secure nuclear uh, stewardship of uh, each other. Uh, how, however, uh, both the countries have still not engaged uh, with the uh, CTBTO. And in my work, one of the uh, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is uh, trying to uh, find other ways where the Indian government and the Pakistani government would be more interested uh, in engaging, if not if not the first step being a uh, signature and ratification, but uh, engage with the international monitoring system because the verification networks provide a great deal of uh, benefit, not just uh, for detecting nuclear uh, weapons testing, but also it has a range of civil, uh, civil uh, applications.
Sylvia, I'll say to you, may it be so. I'd love to see that collaboration. And it's really wonderful the way the youth from the countries are working together to try to make these things happen and encourage the governments to do it. Um, so my last question to you is, how can we support the entry of the CTBT into force? How can people join CYG? And what would you suggest we start to do right now? Uh, one of the uh, things that um, I have uh, realized in, in this field is the importance of, uh, of raising awareness and education of non-proliferation and disarmament studies. Uh, I, uh, I was brought into the, uh, the uh, field uh, with the help of uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. William Potter, uh, who uh, really encouraged me uh, to in my foray in non-proliferation and disarmament uh, studies. And then I also had like several other uh, mentors like Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, Ambassador Susan Ball, who really uh, encouraged me uh, to uh, study and um, and focus on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament and kind of pique my interest in it. And over the years, I this is something that I have been very passionate about is bolstering, uh, bolstering and strengthening women's voices in nuclear policy issues. As you rightly said in the outset, that it is important for us to uh, take a uh, have a seat at the table in nuclear policy decision making and I think that is extremely important. What the CTBTO youth group does is really provide a space for young women and leaders to get uh, knowledgeable about these issues. Uh, they also have mentorship programs where they match you with mentors and uh, like really provides and nourishes your talents and skill um, as a person who is interested either in research and advocacy on nuclear uh, policy issues. So one of the uh, first steps uh, probably would be uh, to uh, raise and help uh, generate awareness about the CTBT and especially about the CTBT in the context of uh, the C, uh, of the NPT and the current political uh, climate. Our second uh, would be also focus uh, or, and shed a little bit light on some of the domestic challenges of uh, why countries are unable to uh, ratify. For example, uh, the United uh, States uh, signed the CTBD on uh, 26th of September 1996, and it's been uh, since then almost 25 years since the uh, U.S. Senate has not been able to ratify uh, the a treaty. U.S. signature and uh, U.S. ratification is, um, and so many other countries look at the United States uh, ratification of the uh, CTBT for their own uh, ratification of the CTBT, especially uh, uh, I'm uh, giving the example of uh, China. So uh, tr trying to understand what are some of the domestic holdups and uh, challenges why um, why the CTBT is not being ratified in different countries. And then the third is essentially to uh, provide support uh, and um, mechanisms of uh, other uh, kind of uh, support through mentorship, through providing uh, opportunities for um, uh, publishing articles uh, to the CTBT uh, youth group members. I think uh, they're doing an incredible job and elevating their voices and strengthening uh, the a group uh, as a multi multinational outfit uh, initiative which have such a big number of young people who are committed to a cause is an incredible uh, thing and uh, providing uh, support to the group uh, by joining the group uh, by elevating uh, their voices is something that uh, I, I think would go a really long way. Very, very inspiring, Sylvia. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And as I understand it, anyone can join the CYG. So um, if you want to maybe put the link in the chat of how people can do that, that would be great. And I'm going to move now to Selena, who I've just met in this last few weeks. And um, Selena, welcome again. And Selena N. Leem is a climate warrior from the Marshall Islands. In March 2021, she was an event organizer for the Washington Marshall Islands Nuclear Remembr Remembrance Day event. Selena credits her grandfather for her deep awareness of the increasing fate of her island home through his stories about how the ice in the North and South Poles were melting and would soon flood the Marshall Islands. At age 16, Selena moved to Germany to finish high school at the United World College Robert Bosch College in Freiburg, where she took on the role of a climate change advocate for her country. Leem was all, is also a keynote speaker at the Geneva Peace Week conference where she spoke of the nuclear and climate crisis her country faces. 
Selena, in preparing for this session, I came across more than just a blue passport, your performance at ICUN a few years ago, and I've watched it so many times and it's so deeply moving. And with your blessing, we're gonna start um, with this performance. So Tom, if you could share that, that would be great. Welcome. Looking out my window, there sits my grandparents and my mama's graves. White for tangle, they are closeted in its inside, gray and still. My backyard is a four meter history of waves crashing and breaking seawalls filled with grandpa's, uncle's, brother's sweat. That one grade walk two meters high, my family's only protection from the water made a mockery. As the water has risen level with the land and spilled over human debris, weaving a, remi a remnant, a reminder of human beings' greediness. To the developed countries, to the advanced nations, you think you know us, but you know nothing. Nothing at all. Should I tell you what is happening in my backyard? What is that? You think you already know? You think you know better? No, no, you have no say. You have had yours with the men from the military said, testing nuclear bombs, 67 of them, on tiny strips of land with many parts barely above sea level, is for the good of mankind and to end all world wars. How many wars have ended now due to nuclear weapons? How many? How many innocent lives killed? Remember March 1st, 1954, when they dropped the Bravo bomb? <laughs> Bravo! Bravo! Ever famous for leaving their mark behind like the mark on my home. The Marshall Islands is now a weary mother of a dome filled with radioactive waste, all from the bombing for the good of mankind. But now the waters have washed it away, eroding parts of it away, cracking and leaking harmful radiations out into the open. So foreign men who have visited the dome to study it say, the outside is even more contaminated than the inside. And they leave again with numbers and calculations, no solutions, not a thought for us. Foreign men, do you think do you think about the waters rising? My island ain't got no time for 24,930 years. Scientists have predicted by 2050 we are no more. No more. 2016, I am here. My island's got 34 years left. 34. But in 24,930 years, we will be able to go back and live on Rodent. How far do you think she will be underwater? Looking out into horizons of waves, angry, hungry for redemption, a booba sits on her plywood 10 inch high bed. She looks at me, sadness and confusion in her eyes. What is wrong with our islands? I don't ever remember it being like this. It hits me she does not know. She does not know what is happening in our islands, not knowing these waves pounding her shore are human-induced. I swear I will fight for this grandma. I will fight for my family. I will fight for my country's survival. For bigger countries mock us after they have violated the Earth's virginity with their carbon-filled aphrodisiac, digging and pumping out fossil fuel from our mother's womb relentlessly, constantly mocking us at 1.5 degrees at the risk of my people becoming climate change refugees, becoming stateless, becoming landless, becoming just a blue passport. Mm. The only identity of this grandmother and me. Will the first three pages of Marshallese stamps be the last ones I will ever get from home? Will this blue passport be the last one I will ever have from home? My backyard is not like your backyard. My backyard is trees crippled. It is broken bones on earth from graves. It is nuclear radiation rich. It is tides with white fangs. It is houses broken down. No more occupants within. It is the land getting smaller and smaller. 
My backyard is my boo-boo Jima and mama lying in their graves. It is my Jima telling me while in pain. Chibu, I cannot wait to go. I will soon be resting, resting from all this world's chaos. I will now sleep peacefully. My backyard is a promise, a promise to let them sleep peacefully. <coughs> it is we martially say 1.5 is all we got. Mock, be skeptical, 1.5, impossible, unattainable. Again, it is all we got. Selena. Every time I watch this, it's as though I'm seeing it for the first time. And you so powerfully inter inter convey the intersectionality between climate change and nuclear weapons and nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands that impacted you, the Marshallese people, your family. And I really know of nowhere, perhaps on the planet, where this intersectionality is so devastatingly apparent with the cracking of the dome there where the nuclear waste is stored. What has moved you at such a young age to become a climate warrior and nuclear justice advocate? Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you to our previous speakers, Tina, Lily, and Sylvia. Um, all your work has been very impactful and the stories that you've shared really has left me with a very heavy heart, but also very, um, grateful that there is a lot of great fighters out there. And I'm actually glad we played the video rather than me performing it because I'm already feeling heavy hearted. Um, I don't think I would have made it through this uh, event. Um, but uh, to answer your questions, I have prepared a presentation um, for everybody so that Tom could open up the presentation for us, please. Thank you. So I am from, as uh, Tina has, uh, sorry, um, yes, as Cynthia has mentioned, I am from the large ocean nation of the Marshall Islands. And this presentation essentially will explain how, why, when at 16, after I was, able, I was blessed to get a scholarship to attend the last two years of my high school in Germany at an international boarding school, it was here that they had a platform that I could use to tell my people's stories. And with students from over 80 different countries worldwide, I thought this was exactly the network that my people needed because I was hopeful and, and grasped onto um, the need that if these people, these students heard my people's stories and, and it touched a place in their heart, then they can share it in their social media and wherever else they use in order to help spread the message so that there can be more awareness raised against the, um, for the nuclear legacy that was, that my people have. And in one of the climate crisis event, I met Alan Ware, who's actually in this, um, in this call as well. It was through his amazing work that we were able to be um, part of the Peace Week where we shared a keynote um, a message together in Geneva back in 2015. And then later that same year at the Paris COP21 um, with former late ambassador for climate change, Tony De Bruyne, who was also a huge anti-nuclear advocate, um, we had a closing statement together. And that was what really opened a lot of doors uh, for myself. And suddenly I was, suddenly at 18 years old, I was in a position where I was getting all of these invitations to speak for my country. And I thought, wow, like our message reached people and they wanna hear more. And that was really humbling for me. And I had a lot of gratitude and I thought this was my duty. This is what I had to do. And it was also for my late grandparents, my late mom um, and my ancestors and my people, they counted on me because I was in Europe. Uh, I had access to all these uh, people and platforms that my people do not. 
and I have to use this privilege that I was suddenly given to advocate for my people. And then as I grow more, then I will open the door more for the people from my home, for the youth as well, for they themselves can also come forth and share their story and advocate for us rather than just myself. Because as I've been doing this work for since, since I was 18, I've come to realize it is a lot. <laughs> And uh, gratefully, I've been working hard with my therapist to build healthy emotional barriers as a empathetic person myself. It, I absorb a lot of emotions from and things from my surroundings and that can really does have a toll, take a toll on my mental health. Um, Tom, next slide, please. So now we'll be going into where the Marshall Islands is. For those who are not aware, we are located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And over here, it's um, that's where we are on the dot. If you just look from the map and really, it always astounds me when I look at this image because it just shows, wow, we're really in the middle of nowhere. And it also explains to me why exactly the United States after, um, why exactly the United States government chose the Marshall Islands as a nuclear testing site, rather than using one of the states over here in the US where they were previously doing their testings as well. And closer is all the, all the islands in the Marshall Islands as a 34 island and atoll nation. So that's where we all are at scattered across a large uh, mass of ocean. Next slide, please. Going back in history, these are some images that I found and wanted to share. Our first contact with foreigners were actually with the Spaniards. Then afterwards, the Germans occupied us and it was actually through them that our coconut industry came to be. And then after them, it was the Japanese until World War II when they lost to the United States. And because the United States, uh, because the UN named the US as our protectorate, which I always find so funny because aren't they supposed to protect us? But, um, after, we be, after they became our protectorate and we became a colony to the US government, that was when they started doing all their nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Next slide, please. So here we go. It was after the World War II, from 1946 to 1958, a total of 67 nuclear bombs were tested in the Marshall Islands. And one of them was the Bravo bomb that was the biggest hydrogen bomb ever detonated in the, in the US history. And that bomb itself is equivalent to one point to Hiroshima bomb detonated every single day for 12 years. And every time I always think about the reasons why they wanted to do these testings and, and drop the Castle Bravo bomb because that was 80% of the US nuclear testing that happened in the, in the Marshall Islands. I just think of their quote from one of their generals and it will be in the next slide, please. The general said, for the good of mankind, and to end all world wars. That was how they were able to convince our chief and his people to move from the island where they dropped this bomb to other islands so that they can test this. And our chief did not understand English. He heard mankind and thought the general meant God. And he thought, okay, so this is God's calling. He's asking us to do this for him. And it brings to mind Darlene Keju's statement at the at one of the big events in Canada. She shared about how, you know, we Marshallese at that time and even even this time, we don't have any enemies. 
we don't even have the capacity to antagonize one of the these other nations that are around us because we don't have the capacity to really protect us. And what exactly is it that they were trying to protect us from? Whose enemies did we have to be sacrificed for? And it just breaks my heart because of the language barrier. Our people were not fully able to understand what was happening and therefore left their home with the promise from the general and his men that they would be returned back. And now over here, I shared some of the pictures. Um, when, the when the Bravo bomb was dropped, it created a huge uproar all over the world. And then the designer for the bathing suit, if you see bikini as the name of it, bikini, the name of it comes from the island in my country where this Bravo bomb was detonated. The designer of the bathing suit thought that once this two piece bathing suit comes out, the effect that it would have around the world would be the same impact the Bravo bomb caused worldwide. And in SpongeBob, you will see all of the figures in SpongeBob are disfigured. And it's, it's, set it, it's setting is in bikini bottom. Bikini, my, my people's home island, which they've never, they haven't been able to go back to because it is still highly radiated and contaminated. They can't live there. They can't eat anything there. They can't drink anything from there. And the only few people who live there are only just the caretakers for the chiefs and the people of that island. And this other picture of this young boy who is being, who is being looked upon brings to mind Kathy Jadanil Kitchener's poem, where she talks about how she expresses her anger to the world at a picture of animals that were tied to it, one of the ships that were purposefully left close to where the bomb would be detonated. There was people protested all over the world. They were angry, they were upset, yet, she questioned, where was the uproar for my people? Us Marshallese who were also shuffled together with all these poor cre creatures as testing guinea pigs as well. And during that time, the United States government has now come forth and they claim that they had miscalculated the wind on March 1st, 1954. And so there was a white fallout that blew all over the islands where people occupied. And many of the ones who stayed in the nearby islands were not even informed that this bomb was dropped. They only fe felt the shakening of the land. They heard the roar. They go outside and there's all these white particles falling onto them. And many of them having never witnessed it, thought it was snow. And so they started playing playing with it, they started eating it, they were rubbing it all over their skin. And just as immediately, they started falling over, getting sick, puking, their skin, having rashes, developing all these diseases that my people had never encountered before. So now we carry this legacy forward, the nuclear legacy moving on to this time period. In the next slide, please. I will now give two other images of just how, how low lying the islands are. These are two of the highest points we have in the Marshall Islands. And I will use these points to explain how exactly the climate crisis affects us, which I think you can, most of you can already know. 
the highest br the bridge which you see on the picture on the right and then now people are saying our dumpster is actually is, has now surpassed the height of the bridge and is now the highest point in the in the Marshall Islands and this is on Mijero, the island that I was born and raised in and because we have so very little land and many part of the islands you stand in the middle of the road and you can see both the ocean side and the lagoon side during inundations the water rushes the waves comes from the ocean side washes all over the land and let, and goes right into the lagoon side the next day the the effect the impact is almost immediate you see all of our because it's a coral island, we have already very poor soil and thin parts where we have fresh water. So our water gets contaminated, the very little fresh water, underground fresh water that we have and the very little vegetation that we have, they already start browning because they've been oversalinated and they can't handle that much. And so you just see them dying and falling and you hope and you pray that there, that the king tides, that there will not be as many, there will not be as many days and nights you have to encounter in order for it to stop. You pray that the next day, you know, you won't have to wake up again to big trucks having to shovel sand from the ocean side, trying to build sand walls to stop the ocean, the water from coming in, but it doesn't work because the sand just goes down with the water. Therefore, the men working on these machines are working all through the night, constantly building this sand wall. And then the day comes, they go back home and rest. And then, and then evening comes, the work starts all over again. And I get my, my family, the elders in my family, they tell us kids, don't touch the stuff that come from the water. Don't clean outside the house. Leave that to us. Just stay in the house because you might, you might get it affected. You might get some rashes on your skin because you don't know about these things that are coming from the ocean, what they've touched. You don't know. We don't know anything. So just be careful. And you see the hands of your aunties, bare hand, because they can't afford gloves touching all these materials they think are contaminated and are not willing to let us touch. <sighs> Next slide, please. And this is how the crisis I, my people and I are facing today. The photo of the grave on the left side, on the right side, that is right next to my house. And it is actually where my dad is currently buried and my grandmother on his side. But luckily they have built a seawall over there and it's high enough that the water doesn't come in. But this used to be, there used to be, um, there used to be trees over beyond where the graves are. And my friends and I used to play here all the time. We would serenade and sing under the pandanus trees and trying to look all cute for the boys. <laughs> and it just brings a lot of memories, like really silly memories from back then. But now these trees are gone. And now when I go back home, it's just the seawall that is there. And you can see from the image on the left side, that is Mijero, my home island. And as you can see the middle, the middle line, that's the road. And you just stand there and literally both waters are on both sides. So every time we have these inundations, they always tell us to go to higher grounds. I'm like, none of the buildings here are even that high. And it just makes you think, oh my goodness, if there is a tsunami or even a really high waves, like what? How are we going to escape? There really is no escape for us back home. And I sit down with my elders and I listen to them talk about 
how when they were younger, that nuclear crisis was what they were facing. The deformities of babies they gave birth to, a lot of them passed away. How they lost homes. And myself as from Udruk, one of the islands that, one of the four islands that is only recognized by the United States government as the only four islands that were affected by the bombing, which is not true, but they only recognize these four. I am from that island too. And I wonder and worry in the future whether I might have, might form some illnesses afterwards. I see the effect it has on my family as well and my family members. And it's just heartbreaking to see history and to see repeated and to see us having to face the climate crisis now. It makes you question like, isn't, wasn't once enough. And I mentioned in the poem that we only had 34 years left until 2050. And now because we haven't been consistent with our work towards the climate crisis and a lot of the social issues that are affecting the world, our timeline has shortened to 2030. It is 2021 now. So my island, literally our lifeline is just nine years from now. And it's just hard to watch that poem because that 2050 shortened by a lot and a lot of years for us at least. Next slide, please. And now these are just photos that I've taken from my post, uh, from my phone. These are the faces of people, of friends and families of mine. They're the ones I scroll through for my, through my phone whenever I need extra motivation, when I feel like I can't handle all the emotions that will overwhelm me whenever I talk about these issues. I just look at them and I remember their faces and I tell myself, remember where you started. Remember that these are the people you're fighting for and they count on you and you're not alone in this race. Next slide, please. And this is my home that I fight for, my backyard which I spoke about in the poem. First picture on the left, that's my window. Those are my grandparents and my mom's graves. And then our seawall that is constantly broken and our uncles have to fix it every day. And then the reef in the middle where I always sit at and talk to the ocean for hours and hours and hours, even after I have been upset by the water water for bringing all the waste and dumping them to my grandparents' graves. Because to me, I find it disrespectful because that's their resting grave. But in the oceans and the earth's anger, it wouldn't really care because we haven't been doing what we are supposed to do. We've just been taking advantage. And last slide, please. So taking forth all these wealth of knowledge that I've gotten from my people, from the texts that I've re read and stories that I've heard, We've been using art as a means to advocate and tell our stories. Because for myself personally, I find a lot of the feelings that I feel I'm really able to just express them through art. And in speech, you have to, there's a formality that you have to stick to. And I find that restrictive at times. And I feel like in a lot of these events that I've been to, 
the emotion and the human story is missing. And art is able to come through that. And as people with history rich in storytelling, with song, songwriting, with, with singing, with painting, we have a lot and a lot of gifted young people in my country and, and our elders as well. And by utilizing what we are the best at, we are able to really advocate and raise awareness on the nuclear issue and the climate crisis that we have. And especially illustrating how we have a dome, which I talked about in the poem. And this dome is cracking and it's eroding and the oceans are rising. And there was a sign there that said, do not return for 25,000 years. And as I've said, 25,000, nine years we have left, it doesn't add up. And that's the final slide. Selena, you're, you're, thank you so much for sharing from your heart. And this story is just with all of us right now. Um, and I can feel your emotion and, and um, I'm just so deeply honored and, um, and wanna just say that we're there with you and supporting you right now. You said to me early this morning that your presentation, which I hadn't seen, would be your testimony. And I see that it is your testimony. And so I'm gonna put in the chat to everyone the testimony that you gave um, to the, at the UN General Assemb Assembly Day last year on the day to ban all nuclear tests um, on behalf of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for people to see. And we're nearly, we're just about over time. So I just wanna ask you in closing um, to tell us um, about, you gave a rousing call at the end of that presentation at the UN um, to support the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. If you could share with us why it's so important to you and your family and the Marshallese people, this treaty, the TPNW, could you give us your thoughts on that? please. My thoughts are really similar to all the answers before in that we don't want history to repeat itself. This is an injustice that has been caused on people who did not, were not informed of what was really happening. It is for people to be able to go back to their home, for my home to be where it still is. It is from my country as well in that because of our relationship with the US, with the Compact, the Free Association, my country hasn't signed the TPNW, which for myself is like a slap in the face. But after talking with some of our politicians, I understand that there is politics going on behind that. And the COFA agreement is playing a huge part in that. And it's something that I myself need to understand more because there's a lot of terms that I don't understand and how all these political decisions are made. But we are obligated to the U.S. at the moment because of the compact agreement. And because of that, my country is not able to sign the TPNW. And now I'm disappointed at, I understand them, but I'm also disappointed at them. And so now I'm looking at other countries who don't have this political relationship or this binding with the US to push forth and do a lot of the work in the UN and in these government spaces while myself and my people will do the work in the ground and continue to raise awareness and, and find to see if we can find any loophole or something that can make the Marshall Islands be able to sign the TPNW and ratify and just be, just stand by itself on its own. Thank you. May it be so, may it be so. Um, I want to invite, you and um, Tina 
and Sylvia, Lily had to just go off to a meeting to just share one final question for each of you. Um, and if you could just answer maybe in one, one or one minute or so, um, what is your vision, your hope, your prayer for restorative justice? And we can start with any one of you, whoever would like to start. Cynthia, I'll be glad to go first. Um, boy, yeah. well, first I wanna thank you and Lily and Sylvia and Selena for sharing all of this. Um, Selena, my heart is so heavy. It's always marginalized communities that have been so affected by this. And when I see you, you look like my cousins back home. <laughs> my hope is that everybody who's listening realizes that we can no longer sustain um, these acts, that uh, what started here in New Mexico has to come to an end, that no one has ever been safe, and that we should not put our resources into developing nuclear devices and perpetuating such a horrible part of the history of our country and other countries, obviously. And my hope is that in sharing our stories and in allowing ourselves to be this vulnerable to what it is that we've sacrificed and suffered, that other people will join with us um, in hoping for the, the RICA amendments for starters that would take care of the Pacific Islanders and the people of New Mexico, but also in signing the treaties that would put an end to this insanity. Uh, there's no safe testing of nuclear weapons. There's no safe development of nuclear weapons. There's no safe use of nuclear weapons, and there are no winners in any part of this equation. And so, you know, I hope for peace and justice. That's what I hope for, peace and justice. Thank you, Tina. Peace and justice, may it be so. And all of, the, all of your prayers, may they all come to be. Who would like to go next? I can go next. Uh, like really, uh, thank you uh, so much, Selena, for your very moving and touching presentation. It was so powerful, uh, so powerful. Uh, thank you. Um, my uh, hope uh, and vision is that we, everyone in our own individual capacity, we take deliberate steps to append the status quo that we are living in, the status quo of just expanding our nuclear weapons arsenal, expanding and incorporating newer emerging technologies, those integration with nuclear weapons, which just really shortens nuclear weapons decision-making timeline, exacerbates the risk of nuclear dangers, exacerbates the risk of miscalculation and accidental warfare. My 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 sincere hope that everyone in their own individual capacity start raising voices hold their governments accountable and most importantly invest in education for women in national security in stem in nuclear policy issues i'll stop there thank you may may it be so sylvia all those beautiful beautiful prayers may it be so Maybe so, may it come to pass. Selena, come to you. Just very simply that our voices are heard, our stories are echoed worldwide and vigorous actions are taken. Thank you so much. May it be so. And may all these, all your prayers be answered. And I wanna thank you all for sharing from so deeply, um, from your hearts, from your stories, your family's experiences, your personal experiences, your dreams, your commitment, your dedication, your work. It's been such a privilege and honor to have you sharing with all of us today. So thank you all for being here. And thanks to all of you who are who have joined us and are still with us on the call. I wanna thank 
Tom Dawson for his um, wonderful tech support throughout the session and Colleen Moore for her sharing on social media through the session. And um, I also wanna thank Kumuhula Puna Dawson for her beautiful blessing again and invite you Auntie to come back and close our circle today um, with another blessing and words for us as we move out into the world and into our lives, holding all of this with a prayer that we can all work together to make a difference. Auntie, are you there? Are you still there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Uh, everyone, uh, it's so moving to not just hear, but to see and the depth. I say to all of us, in our hands, is our heart in our heart is the love that we can continue to manifest with truth let us all step into this place be a part of the open hands of peace and compassion aloha to everyone blessings to you and your ohana ahui ho Mahalo. Mahalo, Auntie. Thank you for your blessings. Aloha and ahui ho to all. Um, Tom has just put information in the chat for those of you who want to get more information um, about what our mentors are doing. You can go to our resource, mentor resource page and we'll see you all again in September on on the 21st on the UN Day for Peace. Um, blessings to all. Thank you all so much for being here. Aloha.